All right, everyone. Welcome to the STOA. Today we have Jill Nephew visiting us. Uh, Jill is the founder of Inquire, uh, a company on a mission to help the world make sense. And the Inquire technology is designed to enhance human sense-making abilities and unlock the power of natural intelligence. And how uh, Jill got on my radar, uh, our friend Daniel Thornson from the Monastic Academy, he said, you got to check out Jill. And you got to check out Jill. And so we made the connection and we had like a wonderful connection call. And uh, um, I started using uh, the Inquire uh, product app called Lucidly. And it's, uh, I'll let uh, Jill explain it, but it's a kind of a journaling-esque app that helps one uh, increase their natural intelligence. And I highly recommend it. And uh, Jill was kind enough to offer STOA members, Patreon members, uh, a, a one month free uh, and a 10% off uh, uh, essential skills course. So those will be posted on the STOA Patreon tonight. And these are the, the links. Um, and how today is going to work, I'm going to tag in Jill in a moment, and she's going to uh, present, share her thoughts on today's uh, topic. I think it's something to do with the meta crisis. Yeah, complete theory of everything for addressing the meta crisis. And then we'll uh, have a, a conversation. So if you have any questions anytime, pop them in the chat. I'll call and you can ask your question to Jill. And um, if you don't want to be on YouTube, just indicate that and I'll reach a question on your behalf. And we're here for roughly the 16 minute mark, but we might go a little bit over. Um, so that being said, Jill, welcome to the STOA. Thank you so much for having me, Peter. It's really great to be here. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Great, okay. Been a long time uh, lurker and it's nice to be able to engage everybody here. I think this space is really special um, in the, the tone I feel like people are able to take here is kind of, uh, kind of stripping everything down to the bare bones and trying to be as honest as they can. I feel like often when I present these messages in the world, I'm trying to kind of negotiate um, with maybe a, a particular frame in here. I feel like there's a place where I can maybe go down to bare bones and you know bare, bare metal and we can build up from there together. So that's what I'd like to do today is kind of present the bare metal argument and, um, and then take as much time and space as we have to build up from there together um, and um, challenge what I'm going to be presenting. Um, so this is this whole talk is on the, the meta crisis kind of a, and my audac audacious title is a complete theory of, of how to address it. Not, which is, yeah, which we're going to get into. Um, I want to say a bit about where I'm coming from um, so people can kind of understand the lens I'm coming from. I don't consider myself uh, um, a theory of everything kind of person. I don't sit around thinking about the theories and thinking I can add to or develop a new theory. Um, what, I, what I've been doing for the last 12 years with the Inquire project um, is approaching it like I have other large audacious engineering projects, which is to try to identify who are the domain experts and, uh, and let them guide how I should build. And if I'm trying to build technology for let's say the meta crisis, you know, I'm willing to go to any domain experts and borrow big steel from any field. So, um, but through that lens as a builder, as an engineer, looking for solutions, looking for guidance, looking for um, principles that I can hang my head on. So I'm not really philosophizing here. I'm kind of sharing what came up from a lot of uh, wrenching on things and testing things out. Um, and more importantly, I'm, I'm coming from a place of, um, of finding a parallel, which I'm gonna go into, but a parallel when I say complete theory between this and what I experienced, I do have a strong science background and I, and I was able to study climate science um, in graduate school and a strong parallel in, in that it's a complete theory of the climate is quite uh, intractable, but a complete theory of how we're harming it is quite tractable. So, so we'll, we're, I'm gonna go into that in a bit, but basically that's, that's where I'm coming from is I, I consider myself to be do, trying to solve a much simpler problem by re re reducing it down to our interaction with the complexity of the world, not trying to understand the complexity of the world. But before I go into all that, I, I thought 
it would be really it'd be really nice for me and hopefully nice for you all um, to uh, just take a moment to um, I'd like to, to kind of walk us all through a little bit of a a reflection um, a guided inquiry um, so if you want you can turn off your cameras I can turn off my camera um, and um, and try to arrange yourself in such a way that you you just feel like you're with my voice and not with a group. So you can just be with your own thoughts and memories and your own uh, imaginative workspace, which we're gonna attempt to fill with a little bit of reflection here. And uh, I wanna start by asking, um, if you bring to mind, or I wanna start by inviting you to bring to mind this past whenever whatever the time frame is that you've been aware of however you think of the meta crisis so maybe for you i don't know what the meta crisis is to you for you but it's how you experience it so maybe it's something like the meaning crisis crisis maybe it's an energy climate life support crisis maybe it's tribalism however you feel like you conceptualize the meta crisis and looking back on your life since that's been a thing that you can be in relationship to so you're kind of trying to bring in the frame of what is this thing this meta crisis and and the past maybe years months decades i don't know that this has been in your life and and looking through that lens looking through that lens i'm really curious if people here who've been staring this down. And I think this, a lot of people here in the stove have been staring this down for some time. I'm really curious if you have a sense of, do you feel as though a way forward or something, there is a doing to do, there is something to do to address it out there? Like, do you feel like maybe you've heard lots of different ideas or maybe you've conceptualized the doing and the addressing different ways, but as you imagine that, do you feel as though maybe is it converging? Is it a thing? Is it an intuition? Is it something that you can have a felt sense of or move into and out of a doing of? And, and in as much as you can, and let me, first I'll give you a minute to play with that idea. I'm just trying to bring to mind, is there, is there something there? Is there a relationship to that thing? And can you feel what that relationship might be like to that thing that is your doing out in the world against this thing that we're calling the meta crisis? And maybe you're imagining different principles you've heard or different ideas or, or even coming from your own experience of things you've tried. If there, if there is a sense of, of what that is, what that doing might look like, I'd love for you to just write out if you feel like sharing, um, maybe just a phrase or a tweet style um, response in the, in the chat. And then I invite everybody I'll give everybody a couple minutes to do that, two minutes to do that. And then I'd like to just have a, another minute to just read each other's responses just to see where people are at with their relationship to this thing that we're talking about today. Okay, great. Really appreciate, that was really great for me to read everybody's responses. And now I wanna invite um, the second part of this. And that's all, that'll, that'll be it just after this one. Um, so that was, uh, the lens of out there, the meta crisis out there and what you wanna do out there. And now I'm curious about with this same conceptualization of this meta crisis, the same thing we're pointing at that you've experienced or that you've looked at. Uh, do you feel, how do you feel, how does this intersect with your own actions on yourself? Like how does this intersect with your addressing it through some sort of 
something you feel as though maybe you need to address in yourself. And, and this is the same kind of question. So, you know, the, the landscape of psychotechnologies is vast. So for this one, you might wanna take the time to bring to mind your history with these concepts of psychotechnologies from therapy tools and optimization tools and spiritual technologies, wherever you've been encountered these, you know, even the psychiatric drugs and interventions, anything that is about applying and addressing things in yourself and your psyche and your being and your, your character, and your soul, anything that applies to you. This, I hope trying to bring to mind this kind of body of things that apply to you, that address you. And as you're kind of holding all those, that maybe the, 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 I see it almost as a sea, but the, the, the vastness of all, all of these things coming at us to address things in us, as, you, as you're holding all that, the way those have come into your life for you reviewing them against this concept of the meta crisis i'm i am curious about if that comes together if that also forms a shape of anything or if that does it stay fractured or is it starting to is it starting to form a theme or a sense or an intuition around some thing some way to address you as part of the meta crisis a doing this with yourself. And I'll give again the same two minutes to reflect on that and a minute to read and, and share anything you feel comfortable sharing and then a minute to read each other's answers. Okay, I, I actually want to do one more. <laughs> I want to do one more inquiry, which is back to this thing, this meta crisis animal wisdom crisis, meaning crisis, mental health crisis, climate crisis, all these crises. If anybody already has a sense of, and has, I'm curious if anybody has a sense of when, when you imagine that thing, do you see, do you sense, feel into it any, anything that feels like, even if you don't know how to name it, anything that feels like they're coming from the same place, that there's, there's something coming from the same place there's there's a an ability maybe an intuition that there should be an ability to unify these crises into something they all share and, and if you do feel like that you can you can also just uh type out and acknowledge that yes i you know i have this sense and that can be true of any of the questions if you still want to answer them you don't have to say what the sense is you could just say i do have a sense i do have a sense that it's possible that there could be something like a theory of everything for addressing the meta crisis or it doesn't feel like that could be true it doesn't feel like it could be one thing it feels like it's, it has to be many things And I'll give one minute, one minute to reflect and one minute to read on that one. Okay, that's time. Thank you everybody for participating in that. And that was really helpful for me to get a sense of where the people that shared in here are at on the call. So I feel like I'm talking to you in a little more personalized way. And um, let's see, I just a couple more answers come in. So maybe I'll take a second here. Okay, my video back on. Um, great. Okay, Peter, let's see. I better chop, chop. I'm already got quite a way in here. So um, let me see. I'm going to share my screen and jump into the presentation. Oh, let me see. I already did that. Um, Okay, so um, I'm going to attempt to just 
tweet my talk and not explain and just declare things because what I'm about ready to go over is um, would be well beyond the scope of the time we have together to back up. So this is really just almost like an invitation to go deeper into these arguments. And if people are, uh, and they don't, you don't need to, you could take my word for it <laughs> and, um, and just move on or, or you can um, dive in deeper on the Inquire site, um, the website inquire.io. You can go to the slash learn uh, if you want to see where um, I have uh, got put a lot of effort into diving into these, um, unpacking these arguments deeper, particularly through a, po a podcast series we put together on the topic. Um, and I'm also open to people emailing me with questions if they want to jump into stuff. So, um, you know, I think it's really important to get to the bottom of these these arguments and if people um, have gone through, you know, what um, I've presented and feels that there's problems with it, that'll only make the argument stronger. So I very much invite that. Um, and again, I consider myself more a curate, curator. Um, and so I don't, everything I'm about ready to say, I'd be, I would be in a position to back up, even though I won't back up here. It's someone, everyone, these are all other people's ideas, basically is what I'm trying to say. So we already did this part. Okay, so um, there's gonna be 13 kind of tweet-like things I'm gonna try to convey here quickly before we jump into a discussion. So um, so I'm saying that um, I, I got a lot of acknowledgement in the, in the chat that, that uh, this the same, the same thing that um, E. McGillcrest noted in his, his books when he put out his books um, dealing with the hemispheric uh, differences um, it, his opus, which I'm going to be referencing quite a bit um, on the hemispheric differences, that when he put out that work, he got a lot of feedback that people, th that what he has re revealing people had a sense of, and that this is a, a shared sense. And this is, was my experience as well. I did not come across Ian McGilchrist's work uh, until um, much later in the project of trying to understand the science behind how to approach, approach, approach all this. And it was yet another crosscut, another body of work that was consistent with all these other bodies that I had also sourced kind of saying the same thing. Um, that there is um, fun fundamentally um, what's wrong with us <laughs> is, is articulatable into a, a fundamental asymmetry. And, um, and so, that's great news because that means that, that that's the smoking gun of the thing we can do uh, to address the meta crisis is, is this blaring asymmetry to our attention system that is problematic in a certain mode. So, so what I'm going to argue is that um, in a minute is that this is great news because um, we don't need to understand everything about the crises. We don't need to understand everything about ourselves. We don't have to predict how the crises will even unfold if we know that something like this is potentially a root generator function. We only have to address that. We only have to address what we need to stop doing. And that might be sufficient. It's necessary and it might be sufficient. And it's a much simpler problem. So I'm what I'm suggesting is that this frame has been missing um, for addressing uh, our, ourselves, our psyches, and the world. Uh, and, it, and it's a familiar frame uh, from addressing climate change um, because, because we're dealing with the Earth system. You have climate scientists who will say simultaneously, we don't understand the troposphere at all. We can't predict it. We'll never be able to predict it. We'll probably never be able to understand it. And at the same time, say the science is in and what we need to do to address the problems with it. That scientists say that both those things are true. And scientists will also say, we don't know how to cure cancer, but we can tell you to stop smoking. So in the same sense, what has been identified in the last decade, let's say, and really coming to the forefront of modern cognitive science is that we're getting a very clear signal on this something we're doing cognitively that's creating a problem and, and, and that it's addressable. And that's the important thing that's addressable and, and that the science is in on how to address it. And that is the dots I would like to connect through this argument um, that I'm presenting. So, so the basic argument um, looks like, sorry, let me, um, Um, 
Yep. The basic argument looks like the um, assertion that the metacrisis has a single generator function, which is the breakdown natural intelligence, which is synonymous with or s signaled by in the McGilchrist idea that um, we have two attention systems every, to try to summarize his work here, um, that living systems going back half a billion years seem to have this asymmetry in our attention systems. This is intentional. We want to be able to have this asymmetry. We want to be able to have, do complete focused attention. We want to be able to turn things into separate parts and manipulate them. And this is essential for our survival. It's part of the machinery. And we also have an attention system that needs to be able to go diffuse. And the two are designed to be able to hand off to each other. But there's a critical asymmetry, which is the one that is focused attention, can get stuck. And when it's stuck, it does not know it's stuck and intends to confabulate. And that's a really big deal. And so that is what I'm pointing at as the root generator function of everything is that capacity for our attention system to get stuck in a focused attention and not know it and then confabulate, meaning to project false causality into the world and act on that. And so um, Amy Gilchrist points at the evidence, evidences it in his vast work showing all the evidence for that thesis and coming out a completely different way, which we can go, which we can go into. Um, it can, be, it can be arrived at rigorously through looking at the nature of information, the nature of systems, closed systems, the nature of what it means to interact with, engage with, and be a living cognitive thing in a real, real world. That there, there are uh, ways to show that if you do not keep those systems open, you generate nonsense and you can't mathematically cannot discern the nonsense is impossible. Okay, next assertion, um, that all virtuous, selfless, healthy, reasonable, developmentally higher attributes, behaviors, stages, states, whatever you want to call it, et cetera, et cetera, are intrinsic to natural intelligence. They're intrinsically arrived at through natural intelligence. Natural intelligence converges on these states. Natural intelligence moves to these states, stages, naturally. Insight processes intrinsic to natural intelligence. And treating them as acquired and learnable as a harmful and violent act. And that, I'm not, I'm just going to let that simmer. The next assertion is that natural intelligence is the highest form of cognition. We're not taught that. It's above anything having to do with analytic intention, attention, analytic intelligence. It uses the focus attention system. It'll always outpace computational systems. It's trustworthy. We're also not taught that. It's distributed, scalable. We're not taught that. Democratized. We're not taught that and our only hope to tackle wicked problems, which we're also not taught. <laughs> so, uh, so that's my assertion is that we, our natural intelligence is vastly underestimated. And that is a, uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, that we can point out, but we underestimate this capacity we have and we don't leverage it. Every categoric or procedural education system, evolutionary path, stage theory, personal growth system, set of practices are at best simple, a simple repackaging of a privileged perspective through a naturally intelligent insight process. When they are applied out of context, they are harmful. It doesn't mean it's wrong to do these things. It's that they, well, they live in a context. That's what the, the, they, we need to start to respect context, context is part of natural intelligence. And when we remove these things from context, they become intrinsically harmful. And they are unnecessary with the restoration of natural intelligence. This is the distinction and the what's pointed out by why we have living teachers, tacit knowledge, living teachings, that we as humans can regenerate and regenerate and regenerate uh, what we need on the fly cognitively. Um, does it, again, it doesn't mean that it's wrong to do this. It means that they become harmful when they're removed from context. Any approach to addressing the meta crisis not sourced from natural intelligence can only make things worse. Yep. 
parasitic processing is the confabulatory trapped focused attention system that is the root of insanity and the meta crisis. So the confabulatory trapped focused attention system is the root of insanity and the meta crisis. So that's another way. And parasitic processing is what we might be familiar with it, but we might be familiar as a experience of it. What, what, what is the experience of it? The experience of it inside ourselves is parasitic processing. What I'm pointing at is parasitic processing. It's not a particularly well-defined term I'm using as a stand-in, which we can go into, but there is a way to identify a felt sense and a, a state of what's going on it's, uh, within us that is the signal of the trap focus attention system that is a similar signal to uh, insanity and where meta, the meta crisis movements come from, shared fictions and so on. Anything that doesn't protect against the capture of the focus attention system is likely to cause or contribute to the parasitic processing. So it's very easy for us to pick up parasitic processing. And we what we're, we have been missing is a way to speak to it and speak to how to protect ourselves from it and how to remove it from what we expose ourselves to, what we take in. And particular to this idea that we would be applying and addressing the meta crisis through applying things to ourselves, it's important to ask if the protection is present and if it's not present to presence it in relational, social, spiritual, educational, and psycho, all psycho technologies to begin to ask the question of, does it have the signal of something that could trap attention into parasitic processing? Does it have the signature of that? And remove it, remove it from that. We don't wanna kill off, we don't wanna kill off systems. We don't wanna kill off, um, cults even we don't kill off anything we want people to embody their full tacit knowledge and remove the part that's parasitic that's ideal it's it's, it's about trying to address the parasitic processes not personalize it into or attach it to um, an intrinsic quality of any one system it's about addressing it through recognizing that we need to start exercising this lens and this is a really big one. False hope is a parasitic process. It's bad business to protect against parasitic processing and parasitic processing in the form of false hope under the placebo effect, the false hope part of the placebo effect, not the true hope version of the placebo effect. We can talk about that is wrongly considered good medicine. All placebo effect is considered good medicine and there's no distinction made between false hope and true hope. The only way to, the only way to kill a parasitic, parasitic process is through a special kind of inquiry that restores coordination of the full naturally intelligent system slash context, I should say. They're one and the same. When you bring to your cognition, the groundable, grounded sense of where the process originated from and attempt to reground it, that process of turning on your full coordinated natural intelligence system will take care of the problem. Through a deconstruction, reconstruction insight process, it will, it will take care of it and it won't harm processes that aren't parasitic. It will, you know, it's, it's its job. Its job is to try to remove these things and there are a lot of factors and forces working against it. And importantly, a handoff to the diffuse attention system through sensing, noting, feeling only pauses the parasitic processes. I should say it's, it's not, I shouldn't say it all, alone only pauses them. It might create space for an insight process that will kill them, but it also might not. And, and, they, and, and in as much as they are attached to a close system of thought, a framework, they might become their own parasitic process. But they are not in, in, on their own 
uh, an ace in the hole with an insight process, then you might need additional help. And what I'm claiming in this is that inquiry is the, um, if, if the parasitic process is dying, you can attach it to a concept of inquiry. And, and I wanna say that under this, all meditation forms are forms of inquiry. And so in this sense, inquiry is an attention technology and a certain kind of inquiry is an attention technology that is able to bring the diffuse attention back online, coordinated with the focus attention. The mind trapped in focus attention does not want its processes ended because it's like in a dream. It's just very similar analogy of a parasitic process is very close to a dream. In a dream, you don't know you're in a dream. There's some additional, it may not be much, but there's some weird additional thing you need that simply does the trick for you. And it's the darndest thing <laughs> that with parasitic processes, when, they, when your attention is trapped, without the check, you will not necessarily know until you've maybe perhaps built up some set of meta skills like dreaming, lucid dreaming, where you might eventually not have to do the tricks. You might have a kind of background sense, but even, even that can be unreliable. So, so there is, um, because of this lack of detectability and the slipperiness, it requires a proactive, a proactive move to kill them, wake up from them, integrate them, you know, to insert yourself into them. There's something you have to do additionally proactive. It, they don't do it, they don't kill, they aren't self-killing. So in summary, the only thing, <laughs> I, I probably didn't convince anybody this yet, but anyway, the only thing we need to do and the only thing we can do to address the meta-crisis is to end parasitic processes, restore, protect, and enhance natural intelligence in ourselves, in ourselves and with others. And uh, the way to do this is through forms of inquiry that solve the human coordination problem between our attention systems and between each other. And that is what I attempt to back up in, in depth on the site as much as I can. And, um, and, um, and that is the end of my assertions. Um, and, um, and then that gives us, let's see. Yeah, not a lot of time for questions and answers, but we'll see how far we can get. Um, so um, quickly, in terms of offerings, as, as Peter said, um, we're doing a special offer to you all um, because we really do wanna support people that are uh, thinking about this and really wanting to, to try out solutions and, and see what works for them a free month of the, the, our flagship product and 10% off of the skills course. Um, we're gonna be um, staging that, like um, throttling that. So if you try to use the signup code and it says it's too late, just send us an email and we'll let you know for the next batch that, that we're letting in. Um, and we're also gonna be launching a beta program. Uh, and this is to go beyond the stuff that we haven't productized yet uh, into different application areas, education, conflict, community, strategy, uh, and deeper, more intensive um, practices. Um, what I'm calling the art of truth and removing root level parasitic processes, um, deeper collective um, problems such as solving wicked problems where we have to bring together many minds and do modeling and this kind of thing. Um, maybe out, outward facing initiatives such as um, surviving or addressing the culture wars um, and more through the, everything through the lens of natural intelligence. So if, you're in, if that's of interest to you, what, you know, the offer is um, just sign up on our beta list and we'll be offering opportunities to you. And anyone that participates will get the bleeding edge tools um, in relation with us in exchange for feedback. And, and hopefully we learn from each other. And, um, and I think this would be a really great community to um, have, have in there helping us. And, and I also put out the offer with Peter if there's other things that you all, you know, want to do with amongst, you know, as a STOA community, that's also, we're also very open to that. So that's the, um, the offer there. And um, yeah, and so with that, if anyone, um, and my breeze past the, the, um, the kind of overview thing, but if you have a slide number, I can just jump to that slide if that's helpful. Otherwise we can just chat. What do you think, Peter? 
Yeah. Um, how about let's, uh, uh, there's a bunch of questions showing up okay. and um, uh, I'll call on uh, the people asking questions. Just unmute yourself, ask your, your question to Jill. I'll, I'll warm you up with a few questions, Jill. And are you okay to, for like uh, 15 minutes after the hour? So we have another like 30 minutes at least. Yeah, I can do as long as people want. I'll just cool. hang out and because I know we kind of took a lot of time to get here. So. Cool. And I was thinking, I have a few questions, and perhaps we can hone in on the, the phrase natural intelligence. And if you yeah. can kind of, uh, explain it again, um, perhaps in contrast to something like wisdom. Great. Okay. So, um, okay. So, natural intelligence is uh, the, it's a term borrowed from the AI community. And it's basically saying, what's the intelligence takes, it takes for a living thing to live? So if you plopped a creature, you know, an, an artificial life creature into the world, into nature, and said live, um, the intelligence it needs to do that is called natural intelligence. And we're so used to doing it, we underestimate how powerful it is. So basically, it's um, the intelligence that takes to make our whole entire environment intelligible to us and learn how to uh, coordinate with it and learn how to survive and thrive within it, including um, a whole bunch of stuff that people don't recognize, which are just these uh, emergent, participate in emergent symbiotic or, you know, cooperative moves that are going to have, you know, where we intuitively know we need to keep our environment in a state that supports our life. Like there are a lot, there's a lot of that going on in living systems. And we have lost touch with the fact that as living systems, we have that capacity. And so how do we, you know, we've, we've interrupted it with this idea of, of an, analytically thinking, modeling and all this, and not understanding that at the root level, this is what we're, this is the hardware we came with. We came with this hardware. And as such, tying it now to wisdom or, you know, if you look at the wisdom metrics, the overlap might be um, something like uh, the analytic processes, the trapped focus attention processes on a stack of kind of cognitive complexity, they're at the lowest level. They don't take much complexity at all. So what computers do does not take much complexity. Um, it doesn't take, it's not, it's not a very advanced move. To move up the stack and do um, higher level cognitive tasks has to do with these imaginative landscapes, these conceptual blends, these intuitive leaps we make where we can imagine things we never experienced successfully, future outcomes, all this stuff we do is working our way up the stack. And when you do that, you first you, you outpace everything that's measured by IQ and you start to move into the realm of what gets measured by wisdom. And you move into the realm of what basically starts to become ubiquitous and um, even among people. And that's the democratized and distributed part. And um, as you move up the stack, as you see, you become naturally a systems thinker, right? You naturally become uh, a, a sense of, of not making such a distinction between inner and outer. Um, and so um, if you look at some of the wisdom matrix, uh, wisdom metrics, such as perspective, you know, um, perspective taking, theory of mind, compassion, these kind of things, um, all of these uh, take the higher level cognitive skills. You're just having to model things outside yourself. Um, and so if you are considering yourself embedded in a living system and having to interact with the interface with your environment in that way, um, the machinery, you know, what a lot of research points at, which we can get into later, um, that machinery of compassion uh, emerges from just the understanding, the machinery of, um, you know, altruism or caring for that beyond you comes out of that exercising that and that would that'd be the hypothesis is that all the virtues and whatnot um, are are kind of um, you know cross-cutting and trying to measure different forms of that and so why would we even bother because we're so good at like of getting stuck not in that state you know in our natural state we'd be moving from predatorial attack focus attention and back out and and we probably wouldn't even notice you know that that there is a or you know presumably we'd be exercising and being in this, this state, um, returning to this state much more frequently than we do in modern times. And that's what Ian Mikokos is tracking as well. So we're spending a disproportionate, we're all acting mad, we're just stuck in this state that isn't reflecting those things. Uh, I'm just gonna stop uh, your sh screen share and you can always bring it back um, yeah. to help the recording. Um, and. Uh, the other, the other question I had, you mentioned the um, special kind of inquiry uh, and
And um, I was wondering if you can speak on the kind of the, maybe the traditions of inquiry, whether it's from kind of right. the or, or psychotherapy. Yeah, that's very good. Um, and then perhaps like how uh, this lucidly inquire uh, product um, is in service to yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, that's really good. Yeah, so the core day-to-day, um, -day, you know, wrenching on inquire was about curating question forms. Um, and from everywhere I could find them and sourcing them all over and then trying to find out what they had in common, what the patterns were, and just to give people kind of some ballpark, you know, measures um, after doing this multi-year modeling process of collection and curating and looking for commonalities and templates. So look, it, it, we arrived at something like about a thousand forms um, that are kind of templatized. And so, um, and then not more. So there was definitely like, um, a landing the plane on it, finding less and less unique forms, you know, they, they tapered off. Like it might, there might still be a trickle of a few new ones coming in, but for the most part, if I look, if I were to look at a meditative or inquiry process, I'd say, okay, there's that form, that form, that form. And I may not, you know, they, they're forms in like a, almost like an algebra X, Y. So people fill in different X's and Y's. And once you kind of see that move, you can say, okay, that's the same kind of formula almost. And that's where the entire body of the inquiry becomes a kind of giant calculus of reason and that's a whole nother thing to get into but that's the parallel with the art of truth that it, it has formed something like a mathematical calculus and that and in the same way that we have a calculus that we use and mathematics we use that we decide to use to describe the natural world what is um, articulatable into mathematics and leaves out phenomena or direct experience this calculus does not leave that out this calculus in, in, is very much tied to pure to a first person phenomenal logical perspective of direct experience and that just came out of what the kind of questions people seem to ask to to precipitate um, these these kind of, of things these kind of states these kind of transitions so there's plenty of people that have been in the business of trying to get people out of parasitic pr processing and we recognize the move the aha moment or the opening or the ah you know and the 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 snapping out of it and the coming to our senses we, we we recognize those moves so inquirers just trying to um you know not trying to but the the work was about uh trying to strip off interpretations and strip off anything other than just the raw bare bones question forms so people could have that inventory so people could in a self-guided way basically have the guardrails to test check and find a way out see if there's a way out of a process they might be stuck in. And um, let's see, was there another part of that? So yeah, so the special form of inquiry, there's, there's some things you have to, to know about it, um, but in the tuning of it, it's a felt sense tuning. It's, you know, and, and so the, the measure of getting it right would be insight, but it very much like I was alluded to earlier, um, has to come from a first person direct experience frame because it needs to bring back online the machinery that is you know that's the only machinery we have if we had more advanced higher level cognitive machinery that wasn't tied to our you know our biology is a naturally intelligent system we might be able to do third person you know wise reasoning but um that's not really you know how it works that we don't really that that just doesn't exist and also doesn't exist in physics they the the frame used for doing real, um, the most reliable frame for doing real calculations is is to take the perspective, a perspective, not God's eye view of the th of a thing, of anything. Take its perspective in the neighborhood if you want to understand the system. Don't take a God's eye view. So, um, so it's very similar in that way, which is interesting. Um, I want to take some questions now, but before we close, it might be good to show uh, them the app uh, lucidly. Uh, if, if you feel called, I have mine up. Uh, maybe I can share my screen because there's yeah. a, lot, a lot of cool modules in it. Um, so, uh, Lynn, would you have a, a share that you would like to uh, start us off with? Hey, Jill. Nice to see you. You um, too. Yeah. Um, um, there's something really, for me, there's something really profound here around like not trying to engineer the future, but kind of approach it in a sort of natural intelligence way. And I think there's, reminds me of um, someone I was um, listening to and she was talking about how, you know, governance is like the, um, that which promotes life and what allows, you know, life to flourish. And there's kind of like a grounding into that. Um, so I'm curious as to whether I have that right there and understanding. 
But my question, I think where I'm, maybe it's the use of the term parasitic, is I'm wondering what, if you can just unpack that a little bit, the, the parasitic uh, yeah. processing idea and what that, and, and maybe like where it stems from and like yeah, how, we yeah. would, how an ordinary person would recognize that in play. Right on, yeah, yeah, definitely. Makes, yeah, this is, this is really important and I'm glad we're gonna get to this, this one. Um, uh, there, so what I'm saying, so, so the big thesis here is that full natural intelligence system is not a, it doesn't remove the focused attention system. It doesn't remove analytic thinking. It doesn't remove getting really pissed off or like, you know, attacking something. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, you don't lose all your defenses. You, you don't have to stay even in wise reasoning. You don't need to stay reflective. It's that you don't get stuck. So what, so all we're going after is like, what gets us stuck? And so the hypothesis, which is really worth digging into where the rubber meets the road and doing the actual work on trying to implement something like this, is to say it should be possible to reformulate systems where we get stuck in an equally intelligent, global, however you want to articulate it, way without the sticky part. And um, I, I'm just going to give an example of, of um, some work about that, and then we can go into maybe more abstraction, more abstract version of that or, or change gears. But if you look at the work of Gerd Geiger Renzar, um, he is a, he does ecological rationality and um, his work and some other people's work were able to show a difference between the way we do statistics. If we do statistics in a way that we cannot ground, where we can't actually visualize something, that's where we start making up all the nonsense. If we reformulate statistical, you know, um, uh, problems in a way people can actually intuitively ground, then we can think through them. We don't sound bonkers when we, you know, we don't go crazy over stats. Um, and, and I've done toy problems where anyone is kind of posed like where, look how crazy people are, they think this. And if you kind of just deconstruct that as an exercise, it's kind of fun and say, okay, I can see how the person grounded this ungrounded formulation you gave them. And that's why they sound crazy. And if you actually acknowledge the grounding of how the person grounded that, they're not gonna sound crazy. And the, uh, the real famous example that I guess I'll tell this to um, is the nylon experiment with Nisbet and Wilson, where in 1977 is kind of almost the launch of like where we started thinking we're crazy and irrational and can't trust ourselves and full of biases. One of their first experiments was the nylon experiment where they went out around with um, the, the little nylon eggs and put a little stand up with four identical set of nylons and asked women passing by which are the best and why. And, everybody, and they come by and they'd always pick the bottom left quadrant nylon and then they'd make up some story why is the best. And so they published the research of like, see like how crazy we are. They couldn't tell they're all the same and they always pick the bottom left. They don't even know they did that. They're totally strangers to these how crazy they are. They, they, they're just, you know, they're just going to make up something. Then the, the experiment was redone in 91 with a different set of researchers. And instead of saying which one's the best and why, they said something to the effect of maybe that and added on, can you explain something about why you answered that way? And then the housewives or whatever, they said something like, well, they're obviously all the same and I don't want to make you uncomfortable. So I just made up something. And that's happening all over the place, right? So if you, and there's a whole paper about this criticizing a lot of social psychological experiments where, um, where basically uh, there's been a misinterpretation of what we call induced confabulation where the, the setup made us seem crazy. So this is a lot of the work that could be done first so to restore our belief in our own ability to think and then to stop setting things up to make us crazy. Oh, Lynn, you're muted, yeah. Is that sort of um, the contextual side? Is that sort of like the warm data of Nora Bateson and that yeah. idea of placing within context always and understanding statistics as arising from context? Yeah, I, say, I, think I haven't found any inconsistencies yet between Nora's work and mine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the parasitic yeah. part is, is, yeah. the, is what? The, is so, it the, so this is the, a, the, we know the stickiness. This is, is it the stickiness of it? The attachment? Yeah, if you're to thinking, the... if you're thinking, you don't want to be. That's a parasitic process. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. I'm starting to feel it. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, Fred, do you have any questions or shares? I, I think you got them, Peter. Um, uh, my two questions about natural intelligence and the inquiry process. I think, I think you addressed them. Um, th I also appreciate, Jill, that these are uh, um, little eggs that are huge <laughs> concepts with data and experience. And, but um, I, yeah, I just wanted a little more 
particularly with your 13 bold assertions, like Martin Luther attacking her assertions on the door of the cathedral. You, mm. you said a lot that was very bold. Yeah, there's a lot of bold things about. there. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I haven't thought about this one. I'm just curious about your assertion that natural intelligence uh, well blooms naturally when uh, parasitic processing is what, attenuated and the, the, the hemispheres are rebalanced. Um, yeah, so optimistic. Uh, yeah, and I think that, the, well, it's important. I think there's a real thing there that I want to point out that a lot of this work is about trying to find hard edges and really trying to help people articulate and see where to, how to make these fine distinctions and how to exercise a kind of assorted discrimination here. Because I think that this is one of the biggest um, maybe offerings for this community from the kind of things we all normally talk about in liminal web. Um, there's a lot of talk of rebalancing the hemispheres and that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about something much stronger condition, which is coordinating them, uh, getting them to coordinate again. So rebalancing would be, okay, I spend some time here and then other time uh, just sensing and like, ah, uh, just, ah, uh, just, ah, uh, yeah. And, that, and I maybe train this mind of mine, just like, let it go, let it go. I'm pushing in the clutch and like a spin down, I get a break, you know, and that's really um, palliative care. And this is talking about engaging a insight process and insight processes are intense. Um, they're, they're, when, you, when you're doing them, you don't know what you're going to reveal. They have, a, they have an edge to them. Um, it's not a rebalancing, it's a, it's a willingness to um, take something familiar and accept it, accept that it, it might no longer be familiar. It may not take something that's comfortable, let's say, and maybe arrive at a place where it's not comfortable anymore. So insight processes are, are disruptive. And this is where I think that um, it's, a. Uh, this invitation I'm putting out in this kind of, I almost put up a picture of Kali, you know, because I think that there's this doing is not a, it's not a sitting and uh, being okay kind of doing. It's a, it's a very active doing of choosing to try to find root out and, and deconstruct these parasitic processes in ourselves and others through an insight process. And it, it takes a, um, a lot of courage and normally people don't engage in this process until life's kind of disrupted them already. And I think that um, what I didn't really say in the beginning is that, you know, the setup of what are we in for here? I, I, you know, this is my fortune telling move here and my assessment. So people can agree with this one or not. I wouldn't say this is backed by science, but this is just my take on it. Um, I'd say it, it, it's a, re a plausible interpretation is that we are rapidly going to run out of energy and energy is what kept us animated in a certain set of comfortable patterns and we're going to be uncomfortable whether we like it or not pretty soon in all kinds of ways and at that point we're going to want to rapidly we're going to want to use something like inquire inquiry process that can rapidly have us reground adjust and and update our maps so it's a very fat it's an arsenal of ways to try to very quickly you know do something that can go very slowly coming up with these inquiries can take a very long time if you miss one you can get just stuck in in not solving it and that's par parasitic processing or unresolved things you know you you're not making progress and they're still going and you can't let it go and you know so it's um it's basically um i'm suggesting that in this this is a time we could be tooling up preparing practicing clearing out and also every time you release a parasitic process you get energy and a lot of energy potentially and that's what we see through memoir writers memoir writers are very good at cleaning up the past they end many parasitic processes because they're basically doing an endless insight process because they're doing all the conceptual blends and finding all the insights and stepping back on everything and doing all the moves we know are the insight processes and um, as a side effect of writing the memoirs they it's just a known fact that they talk about a new lease on life and they feel like they're starting over they get so much energy back they feel like the past is really the past so I think there's a real invitation to do um, a lot of this preemptive work um, if people are, you know, seeing it coming, <laughs> seeing the tra train coming down the tracks, and also just in practice because we're going to have to get very agile. And another thing about the Inquire platform is that that graph I mentioned, that kind of um, calculus, also serves as a modeling framework where you can very rapidly model, remodel, deconstruct models of, of your meaning of your world. And I think that's another thing that that is a, something we probably want need to be able to tool up around. So yeah, it's not it's it's a quite an active 
process and kind of can be a very intense process. And that's another reason we wanted to do the beta program for the more intense parts of the process is we want to be able to recruit for people that are wanting to do more intense processes that we wouldn't just say, here's a product on the internet for $7 a month you can play with, you know, where we'd be guiding people through how to get bigger root level insights or more global um, parasitic processes. That I'm just, uh, uh, on the one hand, you, you strongly say that um, a lot of methods are anti-democratic, that, that one's developmental models can be rapidly to democratic. And on the other hand, you're noting the difficulty and challenge of um, application of inquiry to one's own um, inner, inner world. Um, so I mean, just, just, just attention. It, that uh, is, oh, what, but I'm not quite getting it. What's the, what are the two well, parts of attention? The, on, the, on the one hand, you describe something that's quite intense and that um, yeah. requires a, a bit of work and strong commitment and presumably strong motivation. And um, let's see, we need to find out what the critical mass of inquiry humans is to nudge well, the... Yeah, so there's a nice thing, which is that when you're when you've been disrupted and things are bothering you, inquiry is always the way out. So the the barrier will be lowered. If if you, if this had if people understood this as a principle, they would see it. I believe as the lowest energy path towards relieving what's bothering them. And we get positive feedback from testers, you know, who say within minutes they have insights and feel better. So, it, but you know, the the barrier is to lean into those things that are bothering you no different than a meditation practice yeah so in the same way that meditation practices kind of invite you to be with things um before they force you to be with them i'd say the same practice it's a very similar proactive move of, of saying oh, okay i'm going to try to be with a lot of things before that i could you know maybe put, put off um more proactively or um there are additional interesting moves of just um seeing what happens from say choosing to address it in global like i want to address my entire past so i want to open up all the worms you know kind of thing or something like that i want to uh, go through things that have historically bothered me that i know are unresolved let's say i'm going to reopen those cases up thanks jill yeah um let's see i think there's something i was going to say about um no, that's, that's probably enough. Um, Simone, you had a question. Hi, thanks so much for the uh, really interesting chat. Um, yeah, I th it was kind of echoed in the in the last call, but it was a question of whether you think there needs to be a critical mass of people who participate in the inquiry to unleash a natural intelligence that is substantial enough to overcome the meta crisis. Um, right. I think I think that um, there's a couple things going on, which is that you know we're all going to get uncomfortable, and we're probably going to do this whether we like it or not, or break down. Um, and this at that, you know, the meta crisis is kind of coming for everybody, um, and it's really just a how well can you weather it um, kind of idea. So and alone and with others. So I would just say that like any anybody who is initiate, who is, you know, the parasitic processes are going to get more intense, right? I mean, we're already seeing that happening. Um, whenever we're resource constrained, we start to be, go tribal on each other and pack up and subscribe to dangerous fictions about overgeneralizing and confabulating what other people are and then go about like all that madness is coming, right? So I think it's just, um, I don't I don't think there's like a I don't think it's just a complete continuum of like more is better and in terms of what what can we fend off at this point you know um yeah it's just more better I think there's going to be hysteresis right I mean I think it's I I, I kind of see it two ways I, I'm pessimistic when you think of it direct as direct causality very pessimistic in rising water insight process, who knows what's going to emerge because we never know, very optimistic. Because in my life, I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to have been surprised so many times that people have come to such better things as a group than I thought they would. I was shocked when recycling went mainstream. I was shocked when people thought that 
we shouldn't tear down the rainforest for cows went mainstream like the, i was around when those seemed so subversive and so you know no one cares the, mm -hmm. that's how it always be and so people surprise me and so but i can't count on how <laughs> so yeah i it's i feel like it, all answers are emergent but um but yeah i think um I, I what i don't know is i don't know you know i don't know if um if there's a way to teach this move really simply to young people so that they're just perfectly immune. I don't know if we've had that lab yet as a, or, the, or we have, I can still track that lab of saying, this is what exactly what it feels like for somebody to try to trap your attention system. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's like we, you know, it, it's teaching it like we teach math. Like, you know, I don't think it'd be harder than teaching arithmetic. Mm. It's a great idea. I work for the Department for Education, so I'll get my oh. thinking. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Simone. Uh, Jean, uh, you had a question. Right. Hi, Jill. Thanks for the presentation. I've done some poking around your website before and thinking about these things. So it's good to hear you talk about them in this sort of context where you're looking for people to work with you on this. I was wondering if you had any awareness of particular groups who are already doing work oriented around the meta crisis awareness in one way or another, and what the, what the potential for sharing these tools with such a group might be on relationships and possibilities of collective thinking coming out of such uh, an experiment and do you have any groups like that on your radar well i think the stoa definitely has a lot of <laughs> groups like that on their, their radar so maybe that some of them will watch this um yeah there's been a um there, there's a little bit of a you know we're just coming out of the closet or we're, we're just coming out with all of this in the last few months we've been just heads down um and only now ready to start to to do that the integration work and we are very consistent with a lot of groups the delicateness that I wanted to also come out with, and, this, and I've been doing this in a little bit of a staged manner, is that I am coming out with some pretty strong ethical um, boundaries um, that I want to be upfront with people about, that if your psychotechnology has a business model that relies on parasitic processing, and many do, then I'm not your friend. Mm, and how you, how you discern that uh, with right. groups and businesses is a, a, a yeah, it's better just to kind of right just kind of put the ideas out there let people consider it. i'm not your enemy but mm. i can't be your friend you know what i mean so i think that's what makes it a little touchy i can't just bond and, and be part of a, a kumbaya so easily so that's been the hard thing to negotiate and i've tried to be really direct with people about it like yes i i see what you're doing and you really just need to see what i'm doing and then it's up to you how you want to negotiate your relationship to me because i'm really just trying to bring awareness to this lens of there is a separating of the wheat from the chaff we can be doing, but we only now know what those moves are. They're very new, new moves. There's no, no blaming here. I mean, it's just like, it's ubiquitous, right? So, but well, a little bit of blaming with certain, you know, like certain industries, I think we can all agree that the pharmaceutical companies are a little dubious, but, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's a spectrum. And, but more importantly, how do you do the moves? I think is what I'd really, yeah, like to, to um, work with others to make that become common sense and obvious of like this is how we clean up our information technologies and you know and and don't even get me started you know very it's very similar to tristan harrison harris's work about attention capture you know the the nature of of um algorithms and artificial intelligence systems they're perfect confabulatory machines we can't interface or ground anything that comes out of a statistical system that is intractable statistics we can barely do attractable statistics arguably we can't even do attractable statistics very easily but with machines that take a bunch of disembodied decontextualized data mush it all together and then make up a bunch of correlative statistical patterns and then spit something back at you that's just a, a nightmare for our natural intelligence so yeah so that's where it stands right now is i'm kind of just putting out the clarion call and then trying to make sure people have time to negotiate how they want to work with our ideas. Thanks. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Jean. Um, and that uh, um, 
that's all the questions in the chat. I was wondering, uh, um, Jill, uh, if you or McLean, who's a, a co-founder of uh, Inquire, would like to, um, and McLean, if you'd like to say any, any words, but if you want to share maybe the screen or maybe we can send them a video to watch. So I think it would be good to get like a, a visual sense of what this looks like and how to ask questions and whatnot. I'll let McLean take that one. Or, or not so, if you can't. Yeah. Okay. Can you, can you hear me? So there is, uh, I, I did uh, um, a couple of walkthrough videos. One that's just an introduction, um, a couple, and then one's a, a longer, uh, closer to 27 minute, it's a 30 minute uh, video that guides with more of the context about everything. I think that's um, might be a better kind of way into if people want a preview of the, of the software as as we, we've learned is that the software is a empty shell until you put your meaning into it. And that's when um, everything comes to life and starts to work with it. So that's why there's um, kind of a way to present how the software works, how lucidly works while imagining um, you know, the, the circumstances that you might be in that it can help with and the examples of kind of scenarios and topics of your life that you might enter into um, uh, using Lucidly to support you with that. So we, I, I can set uh, the walkthrough videos for that if that's helpful. Yeah, um, and um, I'll put that on the, uh, the video. Uh, I'll just share my screen because this is a, uh, um, might be good just to kind of see, like uh, at least this is the Life Atlas page, and you can add your values here. Um, and uh, these things, I think, would be good to kind of speak on, like the lenses, uh, Jill, uh, and the various lenses that you can look at. Um, yeah, would you like to kind of uh, speak on this briefly? Oh, you're on uh, mute, Jill. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah. So that, that is what you're looking at. Those are um, the collection of the forms I was talking on earlier. So these are, each of these came out of uh, multiple iterations of, of finding something like this form and working with it and then trying to polish it and remove as much, make the languaging neutral and um, each lens and allowing you basically to look around different ways from uh, starting from the thing you're looking at. And I guess that's a really important point I didn't touch on. So when I talk about coordinating the attention systems, your trapped focus attention system has a concept that's stuck on. And, and in theory, when you're ruminating, you know, you've got this kind of like closed, maybe closed causal loop is the theory, you know, this is this and this and this and this and this, and you're just looping around, right? So, and, and your, your focus attention system is under a state of threat and it's feeling very, you know, it's feeling like it has to stay focused. That's part of the, like, you know, it's not, that's part of the reason to get trapped in it. And so the idea is not to strong arm out of it. You know, you may need to push into clutch if you're just fatigued, but the promise is we're gonna get back to that. And we're gonna take one of those things that you feel like is the thing you're really stuck on. And we're just gonna, instead of you kind of being with the, this tunnel vision, you know, going around, we're gonna open up the, we're gonna ask you just look up, look down, look left, look right in these different dimensional ways. And, for, and, and so one part of the process is to figure out what's the thing is you're stuck on, find the way that makes sense to articulate it to yourself. And it turns out they're, about roughly 12 dimensions of that we can get into. There's like a physics to it kind of, of, of the kind of thing. And once you have that, then you kind of know what are all the ways of looking from that point. And then that's how the, that's how the context comes back. And usually at some point, what happens is you get the context that's missing. And it might even happen from the first step when all you do when the first lens is to say, just try to get some distance from it. And that a whole bunch of psychotechnology to like, just get some distance from it, talk third person or imagine yourself away from it or, you know, tell the narrative story of it, get to a felt sense of it. All of these are just simple distancing moves. Often that's all that's required to get out of the loop and restore the context already. And then the insight will happen. And other times if it's stickier, you know, you have to start looking around and you'll often find one or many lenses that you've never, never occurred to you. And people are kind of shocked about this. I and mean, we're always shocked by insights of like, I've been thinking about this for years and I had insight I'd never had before. There's a lot of the, lot waiting in there. <laughs> They're all over your life waiting because you've never looked at a particular direction and made a particular connection. And so each one's like an invitation for that. And then generally, once you kind of find the one that um, 
satisfies you, you lose interest in that concept. And that's where you tell people to stop. As soon as you lose interest, your mind's satisfied. You, you don't want to be thinking anymore. Great. It, you know, you just naturally drop it and, and move on or bask in some cool insight you had and think about how now you might implement it or what to do next. Yeah, and I really like this. Um, as I was telling you, I, I've been journaling since I was like 18. Uh, and I was doing a lot of these cognitive diffusion tech techniques, but just in a cowboy sort of way. And so having them sort of uh, structured in these different kind of lenses is quite helpful. And uh, I recall I was doing uh, the value of wisdom. And then uh, one of the lenses was like, be a fly on the wall, I'm paraphrasing, but be a fly on the wall with someone who's embodying wisdom and then be a fly on the wall of someone who's not like the complete right. opposite or something. And then like what insights, and I got all this like delicious insights from just that, that exercise. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of these moves. So you're not just changing perspective and looking, there's counterfactual lenses and those are really powerful ones. And um, because what they do is they give you perspective, they, they, there's two, there's wiggle lenses where you remove or bring back and that's, um, if you look at Judea Pearl's levels of cognition, that's a really essential part of higher level cognition and how we understand the world works, we play with it. So you play with moving the one thing that you're fixated on and say, what does this do? And then there's another move where to put it in a different environment and see what it does. And this is how you start to resolve how your world works. And, and that's what you're trying to learn. You're trying to learn the how, the process of how your world works, not the, the thing of it. The, the what of it is what's the trapped attention system. The how of it is the, you know, the learning and the embodied and the living natural intelligence and so yeah a lot of them are asking um to make up like make believe almost make up different scenarios um to help try to find that um, how the thing works once you know how the thing works even you um reveal new opportunities for change potentially that you hadn't considered before and that's the way out right or you you know that, that that's the uh that's the wonderful insight outcome if you can get there so uh, we'll gently close, uh, and I'm very excited about um, uh, this this product, this app, and in, in both your work, um, Jill and McLean, and um, and so as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, they were kind of, uh, Jill and McLean were kind enough to offer a, a one month uh, subscription to the uh, Lucidly, uh, and then a ten percent off their skills course. And I was thinking, uh, I was t uh, telling this before, Jill, it might be good to have like kind of like a, a short-term series at the STOA because uh, we have collective journaling every morning. It's very beautiful. Right. It's like a place to keep accountable. That's half the battle uh, most of the time is just have some mm -hmm. kind of accountability to do the thing. Um, and so anyone can come to collective journaling and do this this uh, uh, lucidly, but it'd be good to have like sessions uh, at the STOA. Yeah. Where you can just kind of like work in silence and maybe have some conversations before and after. So if you're That'd open, you arrange that. Yeah, absolutely. We'd, we'd love to support um, accountability groups. There's also collective practices we'd want to try. We could try out with groups if we had a group at our disposal. It'd be really great. And um, that would be the, the grounds of starting to eventually build up to larger and larger organizations or wicked problems, that kind of thing, is to start to work with the collective modes as well. So, we, so that might be a really nice project at the store. Absolutely. Cool. So uh, yeah. I'll circle back, we'll arrange that, and then I'll list the. Uh, um, I'll post uh, after I post this video, I'll post for, for Patreons where they can get those promo codes. Mm -hmm. And um, so any any kind of words you'd like to uh, leave us with today, uh, Jill? Uh, one small word is I don't know if I said it before, so I'll say it again. If you use the promo code and you have any problems, just shoot us an email and we'll work it out. And we're also going to be throttling people just in case we're so popular. We don't want the entire Stoic community coming in at the same time because we're not ready for that. So we'll go as fast as we can to get you in. So just give us your email and we'll will be pacing people. Um, the final big word, I'm curious if, if McLean has some too, but I just want to say I just really um, enjoyed talking with you all. And it was really great, um, you know, just knowing how close we are in terms of like, you know, seeing the same thing. And and um, yeah, I really enjoyed this, this opportunity. So thank you, Peter. And McLean, do you have anything you want to say as a um, I just wanted to say that I also appreciate everyone's engagement um, in this, and uh, this has been something that, you know, Joel and I have been working on really hard, and the education of the points, getting these things together has been a journey, and um, it's still a journey, and I, you know, really appreciate, I know both Joel and I appreciate um, the ability of everyone here to stay with 
what we're presenting and to be critical when you're thinking and engage just in what we're putting out there. Um, we really feel that it's very important and I really appreciate everyone's uh, taking their time for this. So thank you. Awesome. So I'll make some closing announcements in a moment, but Jill McLean, thank you so much for coming to the STOA today. I, I really uh, love that, the way you presented the tweet arguments, uh, Jill. Uh, really like, a, I'm gonna take that uh, model if you don't mind. And uh, you can check out um, the Inquirer website and also check out the, the stoa.ca for uh, upcoming events. Uh, Unique Bird is coming on July 5th at 12 p.m. Eastern time to do something called Collective Coaching. Uh, she's a theory you coach and she has a really cool modality um, to kind of like uh, do some co-coaching so you can check that out. And uh, yeah, everyone, thank you so much for coming to Stella today. <laughs>